Usually I take out my mask uh, before I preach, but today I took off my mask before the special music. Because uh, I would like you to see my beautiful smile. Because <laughs> my wife would always remind me whenever I stand. Now she doesn't need to remind me, okay? I had it's always uh, a joy when uh, you hear your wife's song. In fact, uh, for those that are married, th that will be the most beautiful voice you will hear, that of your wives. Yeah. <coughs> Whether it's a song or it's a sermon, okay? Because sometimes <laughs> I... <laughs> sometimes, you know, I, I tell my wife, oh, is this the... Because I always preach in the uh, first service. Oh, is this the second service? You're now the speaker. <coughs> but anyway, uh, it's uh, uh, last night. Uh, it was a joy because I heard that song before I slept. And this morning when I woke up, she was singing the song, practicing. So you know, it's a beautiful thing to wake up with a beautiful song. <coughs> anyway, it's a joy to be here in our church and to see every one of you. Our topic today is about religious liberty. And our conference, from the general conference down to the local conferences, encourage us to at least preach one uh, religious liberty uh, sermon at least once a, uh, once a year to remind or to acquaint our brothers and sisters, our church, that uh, we put emphasis as a church in religious liberty. And uh, so I'm uh, preaching one today, uh, although this is one of the most difficult subjects to preach because uh, sometimes you could not avoid but deal on government. And when you deal on government, there's something uh, that we don't like to discuss is politics. And uh, politics should have no place in church uh, discussion. Uh, it should be our individual uh, <coughs> belief or choices when it comes to politics. And uh, because politics has sometimes divided churches, you know, and, uh, and families and friends. And so that's one thing we'd like to avoid. <coughs> but religious liberty has been in our church since uh, the beginning, since. Uh, Early Adventist experience, uh, the, uh, our pioneers uh, experienced the various uh, blue laws uh, that were promulgated and given in the late 1800s when the church was beginning, which uh, these blue laws often criminalize worship on Saturday, our Sabbath, as you know, instead of the general Sabbath, uh, Sunday expectation as uh, many of the churches observed during the time, many of the Christian churches. And so in order to protect our firm belief and worship on Saturday, our church put emphasis on religious liberty. Now, what are the declarations of religious liberty? And this is the points I would like to uh, share with you this morning. <coughs> First, what is religious liberty? First, it is the God-given right. It's a God-given right. And religious liberty is best exercised when church and state are separate. And so that's the point we would like to focus in today, the separation of church and state. Second declaration of principle of religious liber liberty is government is God's agency to protect individual rights and to conduct civil affairs. And in exercising these responsibilities, officials, government officials are entitled to respect and also cooperation. And we believe in rendering to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God's the things that are God's. Okay. And third, 
this is the last one, religious liberty entails freedom of conscience. To worship or not to worship. To profess, practice, and promulgate religious beliefs or to change them. And in exercising these rights, however, one must respect the equivalent rights of all others. So, religious liberty is based on those three principles. <coughs> and you could find this in uh, the General Conference uh, website, okay, on the principles of our religious liberty. <coughs> now, just to give you a discussion on religious liberty, an instance, a example, okay, of a situation. When uh, the governor of California, uh, do you know, uh, governor of California, it should be, I'll be back. That's not the one, right? That's, uh, that's uh, what's that? Arnold Schwarzenegger, okay? Now it's, uh, uh, now it's uh, Gavin uh, Newsom, okay? When he first ordered churches closed down, due to COVID or, you know, for the purpose to flatten the curve, you know, the curve that we discussed, and to, to prevent the spread of COVID-19, there's one particular church in California, Grace Community Church in San Valley, California. Okay, uh, some of you may be familiar, it's uh, by, uh, Northeast Los Angeles. I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, uh, Caesar. <coughs> uh, this is not an Adventist church, by the way, okay? It, it, this church initially volunteered to abide by the order to close down and to only hold virtual services, online services. The church wanted to live at peace with government authorities like us, you know, we would like to be at peace with government authorities. So they closed down. And the pastor even cited Apostle Paul's uh, instruction to obey civil uh, authorities. <clears throat> However, as it became clearer the churches would be required to close indefinitely or for months or even longer, the Grace Community Church and its elders, led by its pastor, John uh, MacArthur, they voted to unanimously open against the, uh, again the church because they believe that church is essential. Church is essential. They believe that church is essential because I have here the Science of the Times, the latest magazine, the latest uh, issue, by the way. And I've been reading it this week. And uh, there's a, and I don't like to be political, but I'll be quoting some, you know, political, uh, I mean, uh, government officials, okay? And this is uh, quoted by the U.S. Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch when commenting on Governor Andrew's Com Andrew Como's decision to place restrictions on house, houses of worship because of fear of the spread of the COVID-19 virus. This is what uh, uh, he said. Uh, in his judgment, in Governor uh, Como's judgment, laundry and liquor and travel and tools are essential while traditional religious exercise are not. This is what he said, okay? So a lot of uh, government official thinks that church is not essential. And, uh, but this church, Grace Community, believed that their church was essential and that the state requirements to close were simply unworkable with their large congregation. What is Grace Community, by the way? It was founded in 1956, a non-denominational 8,000-member congregation on the northeast side of Los Angeles. Maybe you heard this uh, 
about this sister. It's a big congregation right there. And the church asserted that the church, a church operates separately from government control. And in a statement released on July 24, 2020, the elders wrote, Christ is Lord of all. He is the one true head of the church. He is also king of kings, sovereign over any earthly authority. And continues, our church has always stood immovably on those biblical principles. And as his people, we are subject to his will and commands as revealed in scripture. And they continued, therefore we cannot and will not acquiesce to government imposed moratorium on our weekly congregational worship or other regular corporate gatherings. Compliance would be disobedience to our Lord's clear commands. Is what the, they said. So, what do you think? How did the government respond? Well, the county of Los Angeles responded by threatening the church, the leaders, the pastor, the elders, with a daily fine of $1,000 or arrest. So what did the church do? Well, the church hired attorneys from the Thomas Moore Society to defend their position. And the attorney Jenna Ellis responded by saying that in uh, uh, her writing, Grace Community Church has every right to assemble without impossible and unreasonable infringement from the state. And the state has absolutely no power to impose restrictions it is demanding. It says, she said, church is essential and the government has no power to arbitrate whether religious organizations are essential. It is not about health and safety. It is about targeting churches. This is how she responded. She said, church is always essential. And the church filed a lawsuit against the state of California and the local county and city governments. The, co <clears throat> the complaint, in their complaint, they argued that churches are being targeted or being treated differently from other groups. What are the other groups? Other groups that met, like those that met to other groups that met to protest racism and police brutality. Have you heard about those protests, you know, in California, in Oregon, and in, in Washington, in those Seattle and Portland, and in, you know, I don't, I don't think uh, there's probably here, but small, small group that uh, protests, okay, about racism and police brutality. <clears throat> the church suit uh, claimed that public health orders were not enforced during those protests by those groups. And that <coughs> those, uh, uh, <coughs> they, they claimed that health orders were not enforced like uh, wearing of the mask or uh, six feet social distancing, okay? Uh, that the govern of, and that the government Officials had granted a de facto exemption to the favored protesters, okay? They were exempted because they were protesting, okay? They were exempted from all those uh, uh, health, uh, <coughs> health uh, orders from the government. So on August 9, the church reopened and the pastor MacArthur welcomed parishioners to the Grace Community Church and called their services peaceful protests. Okay? And their meaning. You know, but that's not sanctioned by the government. So the county did not give up so easily on them. The fight escalated to the point where the county revoked the 45 year lease 
of their parking lot, of a church parking lot adjacent to the property. Probably you heard this news in CNN, and, okay? <clears throat> About uh, a church parking lot being revoked, the uh, lease or the uh, rent for that has been revoked. And in a press release, the church attorney, Jenna Ellis, said, it's tyranny to even uh, suggest that a government action cannot be challenged and must be obeyed without question. MacArthur and his attorneys uh, have stood firm on the idea that not only was the enforcement unreasonable that was given to, to them as a church, it also uh, represents a significant departure from church and state separation. And so that's the point that I would like to drive in here by giving this example that church and state should be separate, okay? At church and state should be separate. Now, in another, in another example, uh, in another state, in July of last year, 2020, the Supreme Court, our Supreme Court ruled five verses four against a Nevada church request to strike down Nevada's 50-person limit on worship service attendance. In Nevada, my, my uh, sister-in-law, Neb's uh, sister, live in uh, Las Vegas. <coughs> and so every time we go to visit them in Las Vegas, you know, uh, I said, I hope not on, none of our members see us here in uh, the Sin City, okay? Uh, they were just visiting uh, their family, okay? <laughs> so, um, but uh, she's been there for so many years, and she has a lot of relatives that lives there. In fact, I preach on uh, at the Adventist Church in Las Vegas, uh, I think, uh, in October of uh, 2019, okay, uh, over there. And, uh, but in Nevada, it's uh, limited to 50%. That's why her sister... Uh, said, if you're coming here, let us know if you're attending the church because we need to register. They need to know how many people are coming and if it's more than 50, we cannot come anymore. So it's first come, first serve. It's limited to 50. In New Mexico, it's only 25%. That's why in the conference office, uh, they could not have more than five people in the office at a given time because of that uh, ruling. <coughs> so uh, Judge Alito, Cavano, Thomas and Judge Gorsuch behavently disagreed with the majority's uh, position on the subject. Those four, but they were there's nine judges, justices, I mean, and five of them uh, sided with Nevada's uh, ruling. <coughs> so, uh, wrote uh, Justice Gorsuch, this is a simple case, he said, under the governor's edict, a 10-screen multiplex may host 500 moviegoers at any time. A casino may cater to hundreds at once, with perhaps six people huddled at each uh, craps table here, and a similar number gathered over around every relay wheel there. Large numbers and close quarters are fine in such places, but churches, he said, and synagogues and mosques are banned from admitting more than 50 worshipers. No matter how large the building, how distant the individuals, maybe more than six uh, uh, feet, how many uh, of you wear face, face masks, no matter what the precautions, you are not allowed to have more than 50. So Gorsuch continued. In Nevada, it seems it's a better, it, it is better to be in the entertainment the business than in the religion. Maybe that is nothing new, but the First Amendment prohibits such obvious discrimination against the exercise of religion. Again, we're putting emphasis on churches, on religion, on separation of church and state. The world we inhabit today with a pandemic upon us, he continued, as he writes, poses unusual challenges. 
But there is no world in which the United States Constitution permits Nevada to favor Caesar's palace over Calvary Chapel. This is what he said. Brothers and sisters, churches, religion cannot be relegated to a second tier status below secular organizations. Casinos are permitted to gather with large numbers, but not churches. In many places in California, restaurants and stores were open during the pandemic, while authorities did not describe churches as essential and they stayed closed. I visited one time my a brother and my sisters in California and their families, and we could not go inside the church. Church is not allowed. If you like to have church, it should be outside. So they had church in the parking lot, and it's limited to a number of people. They ha and it should still follow social distancing, okay? But, so it could not be called church. Because if it's called church, it's not allowed. It's in a parking lot. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> because it's not essential. The concept of essentiality of congregational gatherings, brothers and sisters, has come under direct scrutiny this time of the pandemic. Many pastors and congregational boards and churches <clears throat> recognize the risk of this gathering. And so what did we do? We decided to go online and some churches just went online exclusively. No church gathering, everything is online. And at first, in some churches, doing online seemed to be just, you know, a week long or a few worship only to, uh, to attempt to flatten the curve. But they noticed that months later, it seemed already permanent. And they could not go <coughs> to churches anymore and everything should be online. And that's a problem. Uh, you know, worshiping online is a problem to a lot of church goers. You know why? Because during times of national calamity, like for example, what calamity, national calamity did we uh, encounter? One of them probably September 11, right? 911 or Y2K or what other calamities did we have? Columbine uh, shooting or those shooting. The, the day after the tragedy, the day after that event, a lot of people go to church, right? Why? Because they seek answers. In times of calamity, they seek out the fellowship of other fe fellow believers. They seek out spiritual upliftment from other believers and for churches to provide spiritual clarity on a lot of questions that they have. So people flock churches during times of calamity. <clears throat> Yet during the pandemic, our pandemic, okay, with attendant economic and social issues involved, churches were physically closed. The government closed churches, leaving many of the most vulnerable to grapple alone with their problems and with their fears, to tackle their fears without the aid of churches and religion. Some leaders tried to argue, probably, you know, they said that perhaps <clears throat> Meeting in a church is not all that essential after all. And I've heard some of them say that, you know, Zoom meetings probably could suffice. Just listening on YouTube probably will be just okay. We don't need to go to churches. Do you agree with that?
I'm glad, you know. He said, no, because the Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of each other. Okay? As some people do. Right? And this is my second verse, okay? Found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Hold fast, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Who promised? He. Okay, God promised. And let us not consider, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. But verse 25, this is the emphasis. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. The day is fast approaching. Jesus is coming soon. And the Bible says we need to exhort one another, uplift one another, and that is through fellowship, and that is through gathering, and that is through meeting. <coughs> Well, some uh, members may argue, well, the early church that were uh, facing Roman persecution, they did not meet in a building. Some of them just met at homes, right? Churches in communist countries famously met what they call underground because they are uh, not recognized they are by the government okay and they they can they can be uh in prison for meeting okay so they called underground okay underground movement and some of them could be literally underground okay like in saudi arabia one of my uh, filipino brothers told me that their church the seventh day adventist church met like in the uh, underground floor because it's uh, it's a violation for the government the uh, for the uh, muslim government saudi muslim government to find them as christians having reading the bible <coughs> so why not volunteer for this kind of experience just meeting underground or not meeting in a building but just in homes churches wondered whether there was really a need to partake in the communion. We haven't had the communion for more than a year. Yeah. Is it really important? Do we really seek it? Do we really need it? It is really, is it really necessary after all? Parents wondered if their effort in taking their children to church had been worthwhile while when they said it could just be a click away by their uh, mouse and do Sabbath school for the children online. That's what some of the schools are doing right now. They're, uh, although I think schools will be reopening soon, okay? But children are just meeting, you know, with their te teachers online. <coughs> if meeting together during times of extreme stress and pandemic is not essential, why would it be become, uh, why would it suddenly become more essential in times of peace and good health? When this pandemic is over and there's peace and good health, why will it become less suddenly essential now to meet? <coughs> when it's not essential during the pandemic. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that there might be some inevitable consequence. Because while people will eventually seek out restaurants and gyms, when all this is over and we have flattened the curb and everything comes to normal and everything are seeking restaurants and gyms, churches that have rolled over and allowed themselves to be shelved and labeled non-essential by government overreaching authorities may find that their congregants will leave them also on the shelves. That means a lot of people will not go back to their churches. 
a lot of people will have more reason now not to go to churches. They will find, you know, a reason not to go to the churches when we encourage them to go. Well, we have no reason not to go. And we might lose some members by what has happened. And we might experience it. People might will have the alibi not to go and visit their churches anymore. So it is here that where Grace Community Church and several others that took the risk to remain open shine. Amen. Where they are seen as standing for what the Bible says. Instead of rolling over and allowing authorities to label them not essential, they stayed open. And amid the scenes of social unrest outside and the threats of violence, the church filled with thousands of attendees, all aware that there was a risk in their health, but also there's a need to meet. And the songs of hymns that they sang rose to the rafters. So it may seem foolish or even sometimes dangerous. But if no churches stood up and affirmed the fact that they matter, all churches that remained quiet would run the risk of sinking into obscurity. And that's the reason why I'm glad that throughout this pandemic, our church here in Odessa, we remained open. <clears throat> so today, brothers and sisters, enforcement, as we see, uh, another problem with what we see with government is, it's been uneven. Because protecting, pro, protesting social injustice has not been prosecuted, as you have seen in all the rallies. You know, protesters that have looted buildings and burned statutes haven't been persecuted because they have the right to assemble. It's a right to assemble issue. But churches... Even those who claim to be holding protest services have not been afforded a similar, similar right, the right to assemble. The law of the land in this country has previously recognized that some religious practices may seem, that may seem an, an, uh, antithetical to health and safety rules and that proposes a statistically more significant danger than COVID-19, but they are permitted, although they are against some um, uh, health rules, you know, they are permitted because the state, they said that the state does not interfere with the church without a good cause. What are my examples? For example, Jehovah's Witnesses who do not believe in blood transfusions, the state doesn't interfere with them, you know, if they don't uh, believe in blood transfusion, although it might cause a health uh, issue or a health problem. Government let them because it should be separation of church belief and state. The, for example, Christian scientists, a lot of them don't go and don't believe to doctors, and that's the right, you know, as believers of the religion. Even some uh, churches, uh, Pentecostal and uh, uh, <coughs> churches that here in the Midwest, in Tennessee, some of them have the ritualistic uh, handling of poisonous snakes. You know those, right? And some have been beaten, but they said they will not be beaten, because, uh, they will not die because, you know, God will protect them. And the government doesn't interfere with them because that's the religious belief, okay? But if churches agree that they should close down now, shutdowns will be inevitably 
will happen in over and over as new issues in which there is a hint of emergency like COVID-19 and who knows what other emergency may happen next. And if churches agree on shutdowns, that could happen over and over again. Rather than having a recognized autonomy secured by a strong wall separating church from government, churches that submit without question may create a precedent that lowers the level of protection of religion. In legal terms, instead of the state having to show a very compelling government interest in shouting down churches, they may have, the government may just have uh, instead only uh, have to offer a little or some rational basis for doing so, for closing. And not really, uh, you know, big, very compelling uh, reasons. And this could have broad reaching implications. What do I mean? For example, for instance, and you know, I will close uh, with this example, okay? There has been a decrease in pollution as a result of the stay at home order. Do you believe that? Because, you know, less travel, less uh, gas emissions, you know, and uh, so there's a uh, decrease in pollution. So a state could make a decision that for the sake of government or the environment, for the sake of good environment, non-essential work should cease one Saturday, one Sabbath a month. Now this is just an example, okay? And they could do that for the sake of environment, right? They don't need to give a very compelling reason, just something, you know, uh, <coughs> like that. Churches that agreed in 2020 that it is just as good to meet online during COVID-19 could find themselves among the ranks of the non-essential during the new environmental crisis and face fines if they met. And we could face this. And as Adventist Sabbath keepers, bear in mind that this might happen because Spirit of Prophecy talks about it. I'm not saying that this is a precursor to Sunday law, but it could happen, you know. I might stop us one Sabbath a month or maybe every Sabbath, who knows, you know. I said this uh, is a precursor. Churches have a constitutional right under the free exercise clause to govern their affairs unless there is a compelling governmental interest in a specific issue. And those interventions must be narrowly, be narrowly, uh, be very narrowly defined to resolve the issue. But when churches give the keys to their doors to government and allow government to decide if when they can open, they've surrendered themselves to the state. And it will be tough to get those keys back. So far, brothers and sisters, the sanctions that we see are only financial. Fines for pastors or for church leaders who refuse to compromise and continue to hold worship services as they did before the pandemic may now find themselves in, hand, in handcuffs or in prison. And this type of overreach is precisely why the founding fathers of the United States of America Constitution recognize the value of keeping church and state separate. And when there is government interference 
with our worship and with our biblical beliefs, where will we stand? I hope we can, as Peter says, as for me and the apostle, we will obey God rather than men. And this is my prayer. Sing song, let's all stand. Five eleven. for reminding us uh, whom we believe and we're committed to stand firm and strong to that which we have accepted in our hearts the truth found in your word no matter lord what trials or challenges we face we'll continue on walking close to you committed until the day when jesus comes dismiss us now with your blessings but not from your presence O oh lord in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.